Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the ACOM Hip and Groin Disorders Evidence-Based Treatment Webinar. Focused on common hip and groin disorders, today's program will discuss the signs and symptoms as well as evidence-based testing and treatment. Today's program is being recorded. There is one hour of CME and MOC credits for this program. You received a verification form with today's instructions or you can follow the link that was in the instructions. No certificates will be sent to you, but your transcript of this and other ACOM educational programs can be viewed and printed from the ACOM website. Members and non-members non can view their transcript directly from the website. Today's program consists of approximately 50 minutes of lecture with questions at the end. We will address questions as time permits and suggest that you submit your questions early for consideration. We are only accepting questions electronically. On the screen, you can see how to open the question box if it's not already open to submit your questions. This was also included in the PDF file of your handouts you received with the instructions. This educational activities presenter and planners have indicated they have no disclosures to be made. It is my pleasure to introduce our presenter for today, Dr. Jeffrey Harris. Dr. Harris, you may begin. Um, thank you, Sandy. So today we're going to discuss the uh, guideline which was jointly developed by ACOM and the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons on hip and groin disorders. So there are a lot of disorders uh, covered here, and <clears throat> pardon me. So I thought what I'd do, <clears throat> pardon me, is to uh, just list all of them. Some of them may or may not look logical, um, and I think the reason that they're there is because they cause pain or dysfunction in the general area of the hip and groin. I think that's the reason that epididymo or chitis is included here. And the other caveat about this is that some of these uh, disorders may or may not be related to work. So, for example, the association between hip osteoarthritis and work uh, is one that isn't necessarily well established, and you have to be very careful about looking at uh, <clears throat> the mechanism of injury. So let's do that. Let's look at the mechanisms of injury and illness. And so the reason illness is here is because uh, <clears throat> a number of these disorders are also disorders of aging and don't necessarily require trauma. Therefore, they're illnesses rather than injuries. Uh, in the left-hand column, I've listed the mechanism. And in the right-hand column, the disorder, uh, in this case, injuries. <clears throat> um, and some of them actually are a little bit complex, so that uh, femoroacetabular impingement syndrome, for example, is a combination of congenital disorder, uh, wear and tear, and possibly trauma. In any event, uh, fractures, as you know, generally are the result of a fall or direct trauma, although in a, a person with severe osteoporosis, it could be spontaneous, being a pathologic fracture. Um, Trochanteric bursitis is thought to result either from repetitive use or direct trauma, although most of the cases most of us see there isn't any obvious inciting factor. I'm not sure what the strength of association on that is, but I doubt that it's that strong. High force activities result in groin strain, classic example being playing football and cutting. Uh, Post-traumatic can be osteoarthritis, uh, depends on the occupation and the degree of trauma. Barotrauma, which would be the result of things like caisson workers uh, being in a low oxygen atmosphere, can result in osteonecrosis. And then with direct trauma and repeated trauma, one can get hip instability, although as with the shoulder, uh, this can be congenital as well. And then with high-speed trauma, classically being thrust into the dashboard of the car while not wearing a seatbelt, or a fall, one can dislocate the hip. That's pretty hard to do. 
there are a whole other uh, group of these disorders which are probably illnesses as they develop over time. In the case of epididymoarchitis, uh, infection clearly is the predominant cause, but it's a known side effect of amiodarone therapy. Heavy lifting is said to result in that. Again, I'm not sure uh, what the strength of association is, but I believe it's not very, uh, very strong. Uh, osteoarthrosis can also be the result of a variety of mechanisms, uh, genetic and classic degenerative joint disease, autoimmune, rheumatoid arthritis, crystal diseases such as gout, and then the old idiopathic. Osteonecrosis, in which there's a uh, reduction of blood supply to the head of the femur, resulting in bone death, can be caused by a wide variety of things, diabetes, steroid use, which is probably the classic one, uh, as is sickle cell disease. It's also the result of organ transplant, although it's not that usual. Alcoholism, for reasons that aren't entirely clear. Uh, multiple myeloma, which again, along with sickle cell, is probably the result of clogging microvasculature <clears throat> and barotrauma. Ligamentous laxity and connective tissue disorders, as I noted earlier, can contribute to hip instability. And uh, hip dislocation can also be due to congenital abnormalities, uh, such as malformation of the, uh, the socket. And then trauma and bony abnormalities both can lead to the labral tears. Trauma obviously is not an illness problem, but uh, abnormally formed uh, dysplastic hips can lead to labral tears. So then the question is, well, what are the signs and symptoms of all these disorders? This becomes hard because what you're going to see here is that some of the symptoms, at least, and probably some of the signs overlap to a degree. Osteoarthritis is not radiating pain, but it's actually morning stiffness. Any of you have seen this. Um, or stiffness after sitting still. Getting out of a chair is one form of that, having trouble with that. And uh, it may cause sleep disturbance. Some people report awakening with pain in the hip. If you examine the patient, you find decreased range of motion. For example, if you try to flex or ad abduct the hip, there's reduced range of motion and pain. Um, however, that can also be due to a simple inflexibility from lack of stretching exercise. One clue is that other joints, particularly the hands or knees, are involved. In the case of dislocation, sometimes people come in complaining of pain with weight bearing. Because the hip joint is, in, is inside a massive group of muscles, it may not be obviously dislocated, although sometimes it can be palpated, particularly posterior, posteriorly. Uh, you will observe a shortened leg, uh, and um, sometimes the hip is in external rotation with the foot pointing outward. In the case of a fracture, the pain is generally severe and worse with weight bearing. Again, you'll see the same signs, which are a shortened leg and sometimes external rotation. Interestingly enough, um, pain can be referred from the hip to a large number of other parts of the body. Classically, that's the knee. And so when, uh, when we do a knee chapter, we always talk about checking out the hip, which is part of the look at the joint above or below way of uh, examining joints, but the majority of patients will have radiation of pain caused by the hip to the buttock and a small majority to the thigh. Now, you have to sum up all these different parts of the thigh. There's also radiation to the groin, which interestingly is, is also where um, L1 and L2 radiculopathies can cause pain, and then lesser proportions to the leg foot and knee. Now, part of the point of this slide is that a lot of this looks like radiculopathy, so you have to be very careful with your physical examination and do a neurologic exam. So again, returning to some of these conditions, um, as, as I've said in other, other courses, um, the physical exam and making an accurate diagnosis is critical because the guidelines are all predicated on knowing what the diagnosis is and having it be accurate. That's the way 
inclusion criteria are set up for research so that uh, if the diagnosis is inaccurate, what follows may not be on target. Labral tears are pretty hard to figure out. Um, the classical symptoms are non-radiating pain with motion. Uh, the, the clue here is it's not radiating to other parts of the body. And buckling, catching, or clicking with hip motion. This is probably more common than we thought. We're seeing, seeing this in a number of people. The pain is worse with walking or pivoting. And interestingly, at least clinically, it's uh, pain with a particular stance or particular method of gait as opposed to all the time. And as you'll notice on the signs, uh, the pain with motion tends to be on internal rotation and adduction as well as hyperflexion. And if you think about it, what you're doing is, is exceeding the possible range of a torn labrum and putting pressure on a damaged area. The labral stress test is positive, and the description of that's in the book. It's a little bit uh, hard to do without having done it a number of times under supervision. Osteonecrosis will cause, once again, pain with weight bearing, and you'll notice there's a whole list of those uh, disorders that cause pain with weight bearing. Um, the pain, again, is non-radiating, and one of the things you want to look for in looking at anybody with non-radiating hip pain is to go through a review of systems which looks at the risk factors, such as diabetes, uh, caissons disease, steroid use, sickle cell, and so on. If you happen to have an electronic medical record with a good problem list, that helps in looking for risk factors. And what you'll see in osteonecrosis is reduced range of motion, which again is not particularly specific, but also pain with passive range of motion. Uh, that can also be seen in non-displaced hip fractures, so it becomes confusing again. In trochanteric bursitis, again, non-radiating hip pain, although we've seen patients where it does radiate to other parts of the upper leg. It tends to be worse with activity. The classic sign is tenderness right over the trochanteric bursa and some pain with normal motion. This is probably one of the more common things you're going to see in this list. Uh, it can happen in younger people, so age is an issue if you're trying to distinguish this from osteoarthritis. In the case of femoroacetabular impingement, which is similar to shoulder impingement to some extent, it's non-radiating pain, again, but it's positional and it's in the groin. It's worse with pretty much any, well, flexion or extension, not necessarily adduction and abduction, and worse with activity. What you'll find, again, you've seen this before, is decreased internal rotation, but also decreased adduction at 90 degrees of flexion, which is part of the impingement sign maneuver. Gluteus medius tears are uncommon. What you'll see there is weakness <clears throat> on uh, attempted use of the hip and localized pain. There's generally abnormal gait. <clears throat> Confusingly enough, there's also tenderness over the greater trochanter and decreased range of motion. So as you can see as we go through here, a lot of these signs or symptoms are nonspecific, and diagnosis is difficult, may require more imaging than one would normally expect. Groin strain, which is the result, again, of trauma, uh, and it's usually significant. It doesn't just happen because you got out of bed in the morning. There is decreased strength in the area, probably due to uh, avoidance of, contra of uh, contraction of the muscles due to, to uh, trauma. There's focal tenderness to palpation, and sometimes there's a muscular defect if it's a bad enough strain. You may see a hematoma. You may see decreased strength. I've never seen most of those signs other than focal tenderness to palpation, but there's usually a history of prolonged distance running, uh, direct trauma, lifting something very heavy, and so on. Uh, direct trauma you're probably familiar with in sports, things like pitching or stretching abnormally or being struck by a linebacker. In the greater, greater trochanteric pain syndrome, which I find confusing personally. It's apparently trochan looks like trochanteric bursitis, uh, 
It's worse lying on the affected side, but the bursa is not affected. Um, this one, I believe, is unusual. It may be a way of making a diagnosis when you discover that the bursa is not expanded on some imaging study. Um, in the case of hip dysplasia, there is subjective weakness and pain on the affected side, possibly with dislocation. The impingement sign is positive in hyperextension. Um, there's increased range of motion, and this, as I mentioned earlier, can lead to labral tears or ephemeroacetabular syndrome. In the case of hip instability, somewhat like shoulder instability, there's a feeling of instability, there's subjective but not objective weakness, and a possible history of a hip dislocation, possibly without a massive amount of trauma. Generally, there's increased range of motion, there's ligamentous laxity. This is hard to appreciate in somebody who's in good shape because those muscles are so strong. There's also supposed to be increased external rotation. And finally, rupture of the ligamentum teres, uh, which can cause possible localized pain. The examination is usually normal, so this is an imaging diagnosis. So this leads us to the question of how do you make these diagnoses with imaging, and when should you image things? This gets interesting. The actual way, there are several statements in the guideline which apply to this. Um, if you look at the tables for imaging, you will see a lot of things there, and you'll see imaging for practically every condition, soft tissue or otherwise. However, elsewhere in the chapter, there are statements that imaging probably should not be done for most conditions other than trauma uh, for three to four weeks to see if this will recover spontaneously. As with a lot of conditions, if it's <clears throat> arthritis, you can suppress the inflammatory flare pharmacologically. And uh, in the case of some of the soft tissue disorders, there is conservative therapy that should be used first. The problem, of course, is that these signs and symptoms overlap to the degree that it's sometimes difficult to make an exact diagnosis. However, um, Reviewers sometimes look askance at attempting to order advanced imaging initially, and your quality assurance folks might be a bit upset that you order x-rays on everybody, which is one way you could take this list. But in fact, the idea is to use our first principles we talked about last time, which include making sure that the imaging is going to affect your therapy. So if you're going to do anti-inflammatories and therapy, for example, regardless of what it is, you have to think carefully about imaging. Uh, if a procedure is complicated and the patient is willing to consider it, then it's important to image to make sure that's really what you're, you're dealing with, something that requires invasive therapy. So arthritis is diagnosed by x-ray, but the question there is do you need the x-ray in order to do the therapy, which is generally anti-inflammatories. Hip dislocations, clearly, if you're contemplating that, needs an x-ray because it's traumatic and catastrophic if you don't fix it. Ultrasound is listed. I haven't seen that. And so I think that's probably secondary, second-tier therapy. Um, fractures, clearly x-rays are warranted. In the case of a labral tear, generally that's not diagnosed unless <clears throat> one uses MRI to uh, identify the lesion with or without an arthrogram. Sometimes it's hard to see it without using arthroscopic dye or arthro arthrographic dye. Um, some specialists prefer arthroscopy because of the, uh, they feel it's more sensitive than an, arth uh, an MR arthrogram. Um, I think that's a work in progress. That used to be the rule about shoulders and then the resolution of the MR was uh, improved. Ultrasound, I think what's going on with a lot of these ultrasounds is that they're used in practice in some instances. Those are generally consensus recommendations, and uh, particularly with larger people, I'm not real sure how specific or sensitive they are, and the literature is weak in that area. In the case of osteonecrosis, you can generally see it on plain film. In very early cases, bone scans may be needed. Again, the question is, is that going to affect your therapy? Uh, same story with the helical CT or the MRI. And the purpose of those is to find small areas that aren't uh, obvious on x-ray. Uh, 
Hemoroacetabular impingement uh, is a soft tissue problem. The reason for the x-ray, I think, is looking for dysplastic hips. Um, it's a diagnosis, again, that's made by MRI or arthroscopy in most cases. Luteus medius tears, you know, with a lot of these soft tissue things, I believe the general thinking is the x-rays are to rule out other problems because, as you know, you can't see soft tissue very well, if at all, on x-rays. So with the, the tear, it's an MR arthrographic or MR or arthrographic diagnosis. Hip dysplasia is generally obvious on x-ray. Um, hip instability is a dynamic uh, process, and you, it may require motion x-rays. Um, ligamentum teres disorder, I think this is kind of a, the classic prototype for why the x-rays are ordered. It's not evidence-based, and the statement is they're usually ordered. Um, I would assume this is to rule out other disease, but it won't make the diagnosis, so you're back to advanced imaging. MR arthrograms are recommended for trochanteric bursitis, but I have to tell you I have never seen that to find this because it's usually a clinically obvious diagnosis. So I wouldn't take this as a recommendation to do it all the time. Groin strains and lateral hip pain uh, were listed as being detected ultrasonographically. And I think what may be going on here is that people are starting to get ultrasound machines in their office, and so they're using them to try to make a, a quick diagnosis. The question there is who's, who is trained and how well are they trained to do soft tissue ultrasound. Um, these are uh, mainly looking for illnesses. They're uh, antibody testing for suspected rheumatologic disorder is otherwise known as ANA and rheumatoid factor. Um, you can also do uh, um, uric acid levels if you're looking for gout or calcium pyrophosphate levels. Primarily that's done on aspirates. Um, the mechanical disorders, this is a very general statement. Um, of using arthroscopy as a confirmatory test. Uh, inflammation and infection, most again, most people don't do these tests, but they're useful if you're stymied. And um, x-rays are apparently, this is sort of the crux of all this. If you can't figure out what's going on, then get an x-ray, but wait and see if it resolves in the first few weeks. Um, this page is probably not super helpful. If you think there's peripheral nerve entrapment, which is generally meaning myalgia parasitica. Uh, EMG would be the test of choice. Uh, MRI would be the test of choice for suspected soft tissue pain that you can't prove. Local anesthetic injections have been used. Uh, generally, they should be done by a specialist, I would think. If there are contraindications to MR or you can't get to an MR, then helical CT is an alternative. Um, this whole list of things is not recommended. Uh, using antibody panels as a screen for anybody who comes in with hip pain simply doesn't make sense. Arthroscopy for acute hip pain also doesn't make sense because most of these things will resolve. Chondroplasty for osteoarthritis is not a test necessarily, but it's, it can be done as a rule out. It's not recommended at all. It's being done apparently. Um, so here's, here's the rest of the decision rule. Routine x-rays for the first few weeks of hip pain, few being designed defined as three or four, generally speaking. Routine scans or routine, uh, you know, routine scans are not recommended. SPECT is not recommended. Uh, that's still a work in progress and it's quite expensive. So what do we do about treating all this stuff? You're, again, you're going to start noticing overlap in the treatment and overlap in the list of things that are not recommended because they're unproven. Um, NSAIDs are recommended acutely and subacutely, although there's apparently not much research on that. It's an extrapolation. When pain becomes chronic, uh, there is A-level evidence, but it's generally reserved for flares of pain and after having a discussion about cardiovascular risk, which there is in, for most NSAIDs. Um, gastroprotection is, uh, as listed here, that's used with various degrees of uh, aggressiveness. I think orthopedists tend to use these routinely more than internists, emergency physicians, or occupational medicine physicians. But there is evidence that 
the risk is reduced. Uh, the question is what the risk is, and in short bursts, it's not that hard unless if you are really concerned about this, there are gastric risk questionnaires that you can have the patient complete in a few minutes and or look at their history if they obviously had a bleeding ulcer or something like that. They're at higher risk or they have coagulopathies. There was really no recommendation about the modalities on the right-hand side of this slide um, because there's no evidence whether or not they're effective. It is worth considering that there's fairly substantial musculature around the hip joint, and it's logically unlikely that a lot of these modalities can reach the, the area causing the pain, except for trochanteric bursitis, but again, there's no good research on any of that. Um, and notice that these, this last slide and this one are about generally acute, subacute, and chronic hip and groin pain without specifying the diagnosis. And so this is the classic nonspecific joint pain, which we see a lot of in, in all joints. Um, acetaminophen is recommended with cardiovascular risks or GI contraindications or in the chronic situation, obviously not trying, uh, trying not to exceed um, four grams a day. Capsaicin or capsicum is recommended as a consensus recommendation in the short term for exacerbations of chronic. Again, there's no recommendation for electrotherapy, botulinum toxin, or biofeedback because there's no research in that area. We're still on chronic subacute or acute nonspecific groin pain. Um, there's a consensus recommendation to use a cane or crutches to get weight off of a hip that hurts, but to advance activity, particularly in the chronic area. Uh, orthotics, leg li uh, shoe lifts, and inserts are recommended, but only if there's documented leg length discrepancy. Self-applied heat and cold obviously can't hurt. Uh, no evidence on this. Psychological evaluation is recommended if you believe there's a psychiatric overlay. No evidence here either. Manipulation, there is some weak evidence for subacute and chronic nonspecific pain. Um, and interdisciplinary rehabilitation, which you have probably seen in the back chapter, uh, is recommended, but it's on a consensus basis. The research is lacking here. CBT is important because an awful lot of this is fear avoidance behavior. Prolotherapy is not recommended. Um, there's essentially no evidence in that area. Now, osteonecrosis, uh, there seems to be a paucity of evidence here, except for uh, weak evidence on resurfacing in bisphosphonates and stronger evidence for arthroplasty with collapse of the joint. Controlling the risk factors is a consensus recommendation, but it clearly makes sense. Reducing, if you've ever seen one of these patients, they've reduced their activity already, but uh, it's a good idea. Um, if that'll solve the problem as opposed to giving them a lot of pain medication, that may make sense. The question then is when do you operate on this, um, whether it's arthroplasty or core compression surgery? There are RCTs on core compression surgery, but they weren't compelling particularly. I think the evidence was heterogeneous. Um, there's some reluctance to do this in a younger person, and, and uh, you know, obviously given risk factors like sickle cell, steroids, and barotrauma, this can happen in people of pretty much any age. The question is the issue of how long um, arthroplastic devices last, and they're getting better, but as you may have noticed, there's been a recall on one of the major ones because it unfortunately tended to grind and re release metals filings, uh, leading to the theoretical problem of chromium or I've forgotten the other, I think maybe zinc poisoning, but, um, and they detected the filings and increased levels in joint fluid, but not in, uh, not in the serum so far. Uh, early use of steroids for this are not, is not recommended. I'm not sure why steroids would work anyway since they tend to cause this condition. And there was really no recommendation on either hyperbaric oxygen or non-weight bearing. Um, Hyperbaric oxygen obviously would be used anyway if there was a case of the bends, but I think they're talking about late hyperbaric oxygen here after osteonecrosis has already resulted.
This is a slide from a trial of using bisphosphonates, um, such as alendronate, for people with osteonecrosis. And evidently, um, survival rate is using total hip replacement as the endpoint, meaning that these folks didn't need replacements uh, with uh, moderate to severe osteonecrosis. Uh, over the duration of this trial, which was not huge, it was about a little over two years. So probably a good thing to do. Now, uh, to move on, gluteus medius tendinosus and tears, um, tears meaning primarily rotator cuff tears of the hip, meaning the labrum and other structures. Um, these are all consensus, basically anti-inflammatories, eccentric exercises, and surgery if unresponsive, uh, not generally needed. They've, uh, sorry, bursitis is misspelled here, but they've lumped both the pain syndrome and trochanteric bursitis. Um, steroid injections have a C recommendation, so the evidence exists, but it's not super. Both NSAIDs and acetaminophen are recommended on a consensus basis. Um, when to do the steroid injection seems to be a matter of some discussion. Emla cream is not recommended. Lidocaine patches, apparently, uh, there's no research, but they don't seem to work on a consensus base, basis, and neither do topical NSAIDs. But again, this is a panel recommendation. For groin strain and uh, adductor pain, the recommendations are um, for uh, modalities, but mainly self-applied ice and heat. That's the general rule about thermotherapy. Uh, Ace wraps are recommended on a consensus basis, reducing high load activity. Uh, PT and OT, but it doesn't say exactly what that is. And since there are uh, not recommendations for modalities. It's not entirely clear what's going on there. And NSAIDs, of course. Bed rest is not recommended. Uh, work limitations aren't necessarily recommended, although it wasn't clear what that is. And uh, ergonomic interventions are not necessarily recommended. Although I suppose if you're a football player, there's some ergonomics involved. For hamstring and hip flexor strain, um, which obviously are different, um, the list is basically similar. Um, there's a progressive act agility trunk and stabilization set of exercises, which I believe is what they're recommending whenever it says send somebody to OT or PT. These can be taught and then done at home. Uh, no recommendations here for ergonomics, manipulation, or mobilization. Makes sense because it is not at all clear why mobilization and manipulation would help an already damaged structure. For femoroacetabular and labral tears, uh, there are consensus recommendations for NSAIDs, steroid injection, <clears throat> PT, and then arthroscopic surgery for failed conservative therapy. Uh, these can be fairly disabling, uh, particularly the tears. And so um, to get the person functional again, I think most hip experts resort to uh, arthroscopic surgery, but they wait quite a while to see how conservative therapy, such as it is, works. Um, ignoring why epididymo orchitis got into this list, the uh, therapies are NSAIDs, antibiotics. Why PT and OT is recommended is beyond me, but it's in there. Uh, needle aspiration is not recommended. Elevation and ice are traditional. Uh, but no statement on that. And work modification, there's no statement. For lower abdominal strain, uh, which is not apparently the same thing as groin strain, but the attachments of some of the abdominal muscles, uh, again, the same panel of recommendations, all of which are consensus, and the same group of not recommended things. Neuralgia parasitica is caused by compression of an anterior thigh nerve. And uh, generally, it's caused by things, it's, it's interesting because it tends to occur more in diabetics. Uh, the exposures they're talking about are things like wearing heavy tool belts, which compress the nerve directly. Um, 
it seems to be more obese, more prevalent in obese people. Uh, and if people wear real tight clothing, it can compress the nerve. I think this mainly means belts. Um, steroid injections were recommended by consensus. It's not clear to me why a compressed nerve would respond to that, but uh, it's a recommendation. Maybe people on the call know some of those answers, but it's not explicated. There is surgery for selected people to do a nerve release. Selected seems to be a very small number of folks. Um, NSAIDs don't seem to work clinically. Again, there's no evidence on this. Um, spinal cord stimulators seem fairly drastic, and the panel said not to recommend that. Topical lidocaine uh, was not recommended, and ergonomics were not recommended. But I think the caveat there is if you're wearing a very heavily loaded tool belt, that might make sense. And for osteoarthrosis, most of which I suspect is not work-related because it's a known life disease or disease of aging. Um, there is good evidence on this for aerobic exercise, mostly coming out of the Stanford project. And there are 22 trials of strengthening, which resulted in B evidence, not A evidence. Stretching if the arthritis is not fused. Uh, a um, consensus recommendation for aquatic exercise. NSAIDs for flares of chronic arthritis. Intraarticular steroids do work. The question there is how many of them are you going to do? It requires generally fluoroscopic guidance. It's not something any of us would do unless there's an orthopedic surgeon on the phone or a pain medicine person. Um, acupuncture, there is B-level evidence for chronic arthritis. Uh, you'll notice this whole list of modalities on the right. There's no recommendation because there's no evidence. Uh, also true of Antidepressants, anti-epileptics, and diacircin, uh, serine rather. Uh, also, despite the presence of 25 trials of various quality on glucosamine and chondroitin, the answer is still not clear about this. Many people swear by it, but it's not supported by uh, homogeneous evidence with uh, strong ev evidence of effect. So the trials are there, but they don't meet the quality of high quality trials, meet the criteria for high quality trials. Um, home cryotherapy, meaning putting ice packs on it, is recommended. Uh, not clear this can penetrate the area, but it's recommended by consensus. Visco supplementation is um, synvisc and other things that can be injected similar to knees. Again, that's consensus. There are four trials, but they didn't come to a clear conclusion. Arthroplasty, if severe, does have A-level evidence, uh, quite a bit of it, actually. And bilateral arthroplasties, and I believe this means at the same time, has C-level evidence. The issue here, obviously, is the need for uh, significant um, nursing home and home care because the person becomes immobile. Metal-to-metal -metal resurfacing uh, does have some evidence. Fall prevention is clearly recommended. Uh, because these folks tend to be somewhat unstable. And there's a whole list of other things over there. Magnets and reflexology don't have any supporting evidence. Chronic muscle relaxants basically has no data. Opioids have C-level data that they're not a good idea in this particular instance, and there are 14 trials on that. So then the question is, what do you do about activity modification? Some of this is kind of common sense. <clears throat> uh, acute hip or groin pain is often improved by avoiding activities which hurt, but um, the appropriate activity modification is not easy to find sometimes. Now, as with back pain and various other things, prolonged inactivity results in increased pain on movement. Uh, it's easy to conclude that the activity was causing the problem, but what you have to do, obviously, is to make sure they haven't been doing nothing for quite some time. Some activity is generally desirable. And the modification should be temporary, not permanent. So they have to be tailored to the, uh, and this is probably a duh for a lot of you, but it's worth going through very quickly. Uh, tailor the activity limitations to job requirements, uh, job safety, severity of the problem, and work organizational issues. Um, the pay, this was actually pretty well written and can be applied to other chapters as well. It's also really important that the patient understand the condition and the limitations. So it's important to have a written 
activity limitation or activity prescription uh, that the patient can look at, um, particularly if the patient decides that they shouldn't move at all. That's not what we're recommending, and so an activity prescription is helpful. Uh, overly restricting the patient will get us into the problem of the pain getting worse, so that's probably not a good idea. And education with the patient is clearly a good thing, particularly in writing. So these are consensus recommendations. I don't think there's any, any evidence behind it, but this is coming from the panel who have worked with these folks a lot. Um, and you can you can see that uh, alternating sitting and standing frequently <clears throat> isn't a limitation. It's a an attempt to get people moving to avoid things getting worse and people getting stiff. Really, this should be reassessed every week in the acute phase with gradual increases. Having the person come back in two or four weeks is not a real good idea with this kind of situation. Um, and you, the panel recommended evolving people off of modified duty in no more than six to 12 weeks for a whole variety of reasons that we're aware of, including um, not getting enough activity and evolving a disability mindset. The idea, again, is to progressively increase the amount of weight handled, but that isn't particularly specified. And the alternative duty is to return the patient at first for short periods of time on prior full duty and spend the rest of the day on mod duty. This obviously has to be tailored to the severity of the problem and the job, including load. load. Um, you know, professional football players start doing light workouts reasonably quickly, and there's a reason for that, which is stiffness, and apparently just as with knees, ankles, and other things, activity can stimulate recovery. Rehabilitation for these disorders is essentially the panel said, well, rehab is doing the activities to increase function, obviously not pushing people to re-injure themselves, but to the limits and possibly with coaching, possibly not, and make every attempt to maintain maximal levels of activity uh, as it's in the patient's best interest. And I'm quoting the panel here. And again, written activity limitations. Now, surgery, <clears throat> this is just a review of the strength of the evidence <clears throat> repairing a hip fracture over traction, which means doing it while the patient's in traction on the operating table. <clears throat> Pardon me, has a C-level evidence. Arthroplasty is indicated for displaced fractures of the femoral neck or subcapital fractures, and there are a lot of RCTs in this analysis. Um, also, a lot of RCTs for replacing hip with um, bad hip, hip arthritis, and again, patient selection here, and their willingness to, their age and willingness to undergo the surgical procedure, and importantly, comorbidities are very important. There are a lot of RCTs on preventing DVTs. Uh, this is <clears throat> the uh, anticoagulation situation. We're not going to go into a great deal. There are also anesthesia issues, and there are a lot of RCTs on that. These two would, would basically apply primarily to the people doing the surgery in the aftercare. So, <clears throat> Sandy, why don't we do some CME questions and see if there are any questions from the audience. <clears throat> Sandy, are you there? Hold on one moment, please. The CME okay. questions that we're going to address are three, but in the meantime, while we're going over there, I just wanted to remind everyone to please submit your questions electronically um, or any comments that you may have come up with based on the, uh, the presentation from Dr. Harris. And Dr. Harris, at this time, there are no questions submitted yeah, from the attendees. We might want to tell the attendees we do have some case studies here. Unfortunately, we can't do them interactively because of the way this is set up, the way we normally would face-to-face. -face. But we do have some more things to go through, and perhaps you can be framing your answers in your head if we get through the CME questions quickly or submitting uh, comments uh, electronically for that. So, Sandy? Okay. All right. The first question is, if x-rays are recommended, one, after at least three weeks of uncomplicated hip or groin pain, two, for most diagnoses after that time, three, for most di diagnoses after that time, 
if it will change the course of therapy. Four, if the patient agrees. Five, all but two. And the answer is five, all but number two. Second question, there is A level evidence for the following hip procedures. A, anthroplasty for displaced form, formal. I, I can read that if you want. Thank arthroplasty you. for displaced femoral neck and subcapital fractures is number one. Arthroplasty for hip osteoarthritis, arthroplasty for chronic hip pain, and ultrasound for hip pain. And number five is a combination of one and two, and number the answer number six is a combination of two and four. And the answer for this is five, which would be one and two. And the final question, hip pain that is worse with weight bearing can be caused by A, hip arthritis, two, hip fracture, three, Dr. Harris. Osteonecrosis. Four, hip dislocation, five, all of the above, six, <clears throat> all but one. And the answer to this is all but one. Right. In case that isn't clear, the, the reason hip arthritis isn't in this list, if you go back to the diagnostic criteria, is because it tends to be pain with motion, but simply standing on it doesn't necessarily hurt. Are exactly. Here, about this? Yeah, at this time there's been no questions submitted, so if you want to cover one of the cases and we'll see if any questions come in. Okay, sure. So this is to get you thinking about how to apply the guidelines. So our patient, Fiona Femoroso, uh, who is from London of, of Italian extraction, states that her left hip hurts when she flexes or extends it and when she moves about. The pain does not radiate. She works in an office at a desk and moves files about. She also plays football on her local side on weekends. And those of you that don't have uh, friends who play what we call soccer, that means that she's playing soccer with her local team. And she periodically slides trying to steal the ball. I think the slide may have been made up for something we did at the Society of Occupational Medicine. In any event, so you <laughs> have the young lady come in for a physical examination. She's 27 years old, temperature 37, which uh, translates to 98.6, roughly speaking. Uh, normal blood pressure, relatively normal pulse. Uh, her weight is elevated. I don't remember the exact conversion, but it's uh, about 150 pounds. And I'm not sure I can do that conversion in my head, but she's about 5'2". Now, on hip exam, um, she has decreased internal rotation, decreased adduction at 90 degrees of flexion, which is the impingement sign, or test rather, pain with passive adduction, and gradually internally rotating the flexed hip. That, uh, sorry, that's the, uh, the impingement sign. And um, her gait is slightly antalgic. Does anybody know what this is? Anybody want to make an attempt at diagnosing it? And is there anything else you'd like to know? Are there any other uh, tests you'd like? Obviously, if you guys were in the room, we would be getting some answers here. But um, Well, the answer um, Somebody should have said, well, what about a neurologic exam? Because you want to do this on all of your patients. And <clears throat> it, it turns out it was normal. Um, you may find some decreased motor function if the person has been off the hip enough, um, particularly in the quads, which tend to atrophy very, very quickly. There is a clunk with resisted leg raises. And I didn't put down what the arthrogram showed next. Uh, for some reason, this person decided to use arthrography and not just plain MRI. And it appears that she is allergic to the dye, unbeknownst to everybody, and wasn't very happy about it. 
What's the diagnosis treatment plan? Um, let's see, are we getting feedback on this? A question. Strength of association of osteonecrosis in the face of steroid use. Um, yeah, the answer to that one is it's pretty strongly associated for people that use a lot of steroids for things like weightlifting. I don't know the number, but that's the classic instance is athletes who use a lot of steroids. Um, the answer, it's a labral tear, yes, that is a labral tear. Um, and by the way, just on that first question about steroid injection into a, an osteonecrotic hip, I personally, I said I don't understand that. Um, and I, I would, we probably should go back to the panel chair and ask that question because, um, as, as Mr. Spock would say, it is not logical. Um, so what's the treatment plan for this? No comments. Well, there's that whole list of conservative treatment, which basically is NSAIDs, motion, some undefined physical therapy. Um, but ultimately, this would be arthroscopic repair. So, and thank you for whoever diagnosed that. This one's kind of interesting here. So Letitia Lateral, or Lateral, I guess, actually, complains that her right leg is numb. She says, it's not painful, but it feels creepy. The numbness is vague, but on repeated questioning, she thinks it stops at the knee, might be on the side and maybe in front. She can move the leg, but she's not sure where it is. And this is starting to sound a bit odd. She works in an office where she's in charge of fixing things. And when she does that, she wears a tool belt. Um, I'm not sure I can translate those numbers, but basically she's considerably overweight for her height. Motor reflex and sensory exam is apparently normal. Full range of motion without hip without pain, strike leg raises are normal, and gait is slightly antalgic. I'm, I'm a little suspicious of this <laughs> sensory exam, but um, possibly it is normal. What else would you like to know, and are there any other tests you'd like? Somebody's already got this one figured out. Oh, by the way, whoever diagnosed, or sorry, came up with the arthros arthroscopic surgery for the last one, thank you, that was exactly right. And I hadn't gotten to the diagnosis yet, but somebody's already figured this out. Um, are there any tests you'd like to know, or like to have? Age down thing isn't working dramatically. Actually, it turns out that she has an area of decreased perception with a monofilament laterally on the right leg. Um, however, motor and reflexes are normal. Somebody wanted x-rays and an MRI, which the pre-cert refused. Her last fasting blood sugar was 240, which she is not doing anything about. She smokes a pack a day. She's dyslipidemic. The EMG was obtained and showed pathologic spiking in the right lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. She didn't like the needles and threatened to sue you. Actually threatened to sue, the, I'm not sure if it was you or the electromyographer, but in any event, um, somebody's already diagnosed this. It is Moralgia Parasitica. And whoever these brilliant people are said get an EMG. They are correct. Um, what's the treatment plan? I'm going to watch the uh, Q&A window for a second. Well, if you recall, the first thing to do is get rid of offending problems. So the tool belt has to go. Her diabetes should be controlled. And she would needs to lose some weight, which is also contributing to her diabetes. Yeah, somebody says physical therapy, no tool belt. Tool belt, no tool belt is correct. I'm not sure what the physical therapy would be because we have a basically a compression neuropathy going on here, or possibly a chemical neuropathy. So um, I'm not sure what I'd tell you about that. It is in the recommendation list, but I'm, it wasn't defined. 
pain on standing. We'll do this one quickly. Nestor Necropolis reports pain in his left hip when he stands up, getting worse for about a year. And it's interfering with work, which obviously is not good. So this fellow is pretty obviously Greek. Um, 5'8", weighs 270, normal temperature. His gait is antalgic. The range of motion of his left hip is decreased, and the apparent extent of the neurologic exam was a straight leg raise, which was negative. So one of your colleagues is covering and suggests getting an MRI. The question is, what else should he should have should he have suggested, and was the MRI suggestion evidence based? Keep in mind, at least in California, and I think in a lot of other states, you as the primary treating physician are responsible for all this. Count to 10 when asking a question. Okay. So that, I presume, means wait until we get some answers. So in this one, what do you think your primary imaging should have been? I'm counting to 10 slowly here. Ah, perfect. X-ray first. Could be osteoarthritis, although osteoarthritis is not classically pain on weight-bearing, if you recall. Uh, but X-ray first is right. Now there's more suggestions. Why? What do you think this is? There's not a lot of information here, granted. Um, this is sorry, it's him, not her. But what do you think about total hip replacement? We haven't gotten a diagnosis yet. Yep, early osteonecrosis. True. I don't know about early because this has been going on for a year. But um, so that leads to another interesting question: What else could we have ordered as far as imaging goes? Assuming, well, let's assume we got an X-ray and didn't really see anything. I'm counting to 10 again. Well, if it's really early, then the answer would be bone scan. And yeah, boy, you guys are good. Um, now, what do you think about this recommendation for a hip replacement? I'll count to 20 here. Well, the answer is that it depends on how old the person is and how, how disabling this is. Right, is it appropriate or not? And so that's really where this is going. We don't, I don't think I said how old this guy was. Uh, seems a little early. That may be true. It probably depends on how ugly the x-ray is and what the guy's job is. Um, you know, if he he's, comes in and the entire thing is collapsed and he is a laborer, this is obviously not good, but it's age dependent. Depends on how good your surgeons are and all that sort of thing. So um, that's the end of the cases. We're right on time, and I want to thank everybody for attending. Sandy? Yeah, while we conclude, I'm just going to pull up a quick a few polling questions. If you could just give us your feedback, and uh, we'll collect the results. Um, so at this time, it's, uh, I'd like to thank you again for your attendance and our presenter, Dr. Jeffrey Harris today for his valuable presentation on hip and groin. Um, we do have the two programs that are also coming up in December. That is December, uh, Monday, December 6th, which is the next one, and then we also have one Monday, December 13th. So that concludes today's program. You may disconnect after you've provided your feedback. If there are any specific comments to improve these, please also send them to Sandy. And thank you very much for your attendance.